Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first of our series of five webinars this week, looking at pertinent regulatory and reporting obligations for insurers. My name is Paul Hamalena. I'm a director in our Financial Services Reg Centre. I focus on supporting clients with ESG and prudential regulations. Prior to joining Mazars, I was at the FCA for 13 years, where I was responsible for the negotiation, design and implementation of numerous EU and UK financial services policies. This morning, we're joined by Cynthia, who I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Paul. And good morning, everyone. I'm Cynthia Mukiwa. I'm the lead in ESG and climate risk for insurance sector in Mazars. And I've been with Mazars for close to two years. And prior to this, I was working in another consulting firm and have worked in the insurance industry for over 10 years. I hand over to Paul. Thank you, Cynthia. In this first webinar of the series, Cynthia and I will cover the rapidly expanding field of sustainability reporting. We're going to break the session into two parts. First, we'll explain the current climate and sustainability reporting landscape for insurers. Then we'll move on to the most important regulations that are on the horizon. We'll present for about 20 to 25 minutes and leave five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please can you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post your questions during the session. Now I'll pass over to Cynthia to explain the current requirements. Next slide, please. Thank you. We have identified the existing legal and regulatory expectations for climate and sustainability reporting in the UK. And we will be zeroing in on the latest publications relate in relation to transition planning, greenwashing, sustainability reporting standards, and nature-related risks. The Companies Act reporting requirements apply to entities depending on size and listing status. One of the key aspects to consider in meeting these reporting requirements is materiality. We sometimes hear that materiality is difficult to apply to sustainability and climate related matters. However, there is relevant information that needs to be considered, which may be quantitative in nature and the potential effects may be uncertain and lie in some way into the future. And in respect of this information, the consideration on materiality for it to be included in the annual report is when it meets uh, the, regulate, uh, the expectations of investors when they are making any uh, decisions. For and whilst the Companies Act does not explicitly refer to materiality, there is existing guidance from the FRC in what we would be required to meet the applicable Companies Act requirements by organizations. And one th key thing to note is that the Companies Act requires information on greenhouse gas disclosures to be included in the director's report, irrespective of the materiality. And looking at the various sections, there are specific considerations as long as they meet or benefit shareholders as a whole, and they address issues from a, from a long-term perspective. I'll be covering in more detail the regulatory expectations in the next slide. The SS319, which is the supervisory statement introduced by the Bank of England and PRA in 2019, sets out expectations for all PRA regulated insurance firms in areas regard, uh, in regards to climate risk focusing on four key areas, which is governance, risk management, stress testing, and scenario analysis and disclosures. This supports existing reporting requirements on reporting material risk by insurers, considering the pillar three disclosures and principal risk and uncertainties, which are covered under the Companies Act when looking at the strategic report. The PRIA expects firms to address financial risk from climate change through their existing risk management frameworks and also consider how climate-related financial risks 
are integrated into their governance and risk management frameworks. There are further details and guidelines which sought to clarify these requirements which have been issued over the years, starting with DSE or letters issued in 2020 and further subsequent uh, report on climate change adaptation, which was issued in 2021. And in 2022, the PRIA has actively started supervising regulated firms against expectations set out in SS319. And in 2022 as well, the PRIA has further clarified how insurers have progressed in embedding expectations set out in SS319. So what does this mean for insurers? There is an expectation of compliance with SS319 and there are ongoing assessments by the PRA and where firms are considered to not have met, suffi met sufficient progress, they will be asked to provide a roadmap for overcoming the gaps and there could be consideration to take climate within the wider supervisory kit. Moving on to the TCFD. This has been implemented in the UK on a progressive implementation plan, which started in 2021, where premium listed entities were captured to start reporting. In 2022, large UK companies, where it includes life insurers and uh, FCA regulated pension providers, they are expected to also follow the TCFD framework. And the qualification criteria for large listed companies include areas such as having employees which are more than 500. And also there are steps to consider when actually verifying whether a company is captured by this requirement. So there is a need to actually do the assessment. We also then have the Lloyd's MGA ESG guidance, which got implemented starting from 2022, where there's an expectation that all MGAs would have an ESG framework that they would have put together. And this framework actually supports the Lloyd's uh, com uh, commitment to a net zero uh, position by, 2020, by 2050. And the key areas that this uh, expectation covers is looking at the climate transition approach, which links into the when you consider, say, for example, the UK TPT that uh, Paul will explain further. But what is required is you have to identify your current carbon intensity hotspots in underwriting portfolios incorporating both a point in time assessment and forward looking metrics on the rate of green transition. Then there's also a consideration on the governance structures that you have to manage ESG. And looking at the sustainable underwriting approach where managing agents should consider the most material areas of their underwriting in terms of ESG risks, looking at high carbon intensity business. And a point is also has, uh, that needs to be taken into account is on the responsible investment policy. Whilst developing the responsible investment policy, there, there is need to consider the most material areas in investments, looking at the ESG risks and also considering the high carbon intensity business. If you could, uh, now, what does it mean for insurers? For those insurers that are captured by the SS319, they should be able to be demonstrating their progress made in terms of meeting the requirements and where firms are actually starting on their TCFD reporting journey, they would need to consider the work that would, they would have done in the SS319 and how they can actually cover the gaps that are presented by the TCFD frameworks. And Lloyd's MGAs are expected to continue uh, demonstrating their efforts in meeting their ESG framework policy that they would have presented. If we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you, Cynthia. We are now going to move on to some forthcoming ESG regulatory reporting requirements. 
The sustainability buzzword of 2023 has most definitely been transition plans. So I'll briefly explain what transition plans are, why they are important, and what's the UK implementation timeline for transition plan disclosures. So what are transition plans? A transition plan lays out an entity's strategy, targets, actions and resources for its transition towards a lower carbon economy. With a transition plan, companies need to get under the skin of their climate commitments and explain their ambition, objectives, priorities and strategies for how they plan to deliver on those commitments. Companies need to say what their climate targets are and then link those targets to clear, demonstrable actions. For example, we will invest in new plants to move our operations away from high emitting activities. Furthermore, these planned actions need to be underpinned by operational and financial resources. In this way, external stakeholders can see what operating and financial measures and metrics attach to those actions, like X amount of capital investment. This means that external stakeholders can then track a company's progress all the way from its climate commitments to its transition strategy, the planned actions to achieve that strategy and the metrics to demonstrate those actions are being implemented. So why are transition plans important? I cannot stress enough the three bullet points in the light blue colored box in this slide. First, the content required in transition plans means that they shouldn't be seen as just another regulatory disclosure exercise. Transition plans will be public documents that help investors have a better picture of a company's strategy and its financing and operating plans for decarbonizing. They will enable investors to distinguish clearly between companies who have a climate target but don't know how to go about their transition and companies who do have a target and credible plan. Finally, companies will need to think carefully about how to successfully integrate transition planning into existing business and financial planning processes and have the right governance to oversee the delivery of the plan. Next slide, please. So what's the UK's approach for introducing transition plan disclosures? The UK government launched the Transition Plan Task Force, or TPT, in 2022, with a mandate to develop good practices for transition plan disclosures. The TPT published their final sector neutral disclosure framework for what good transition plans should look like in October. This month, the TPT published sector specific guidance for companies in certain sectors when they develop their transition plans. This included specific guidance for insurance entities. When it comes to disclosing transition plan information, the TPT recommends that an entity includes material information related to its transition plan within its wider sustainability related disclosures in its general purpose financial reports. The transition plan task force also recommends that a standalone transition plan report is published either where there are significant changes to the plan or the latest every three years. So what are the government and regulatory authorities intending to do in terms of introducing the TPT's framework? First, the UK government announced in the Green Finance Strategy document in March that they will consult in autumn winter 2023 on requirements for the UK's largest companies to disclose transition plans. We are still waiting for that consultation document. Second, the FCA announced in August that they intend to consult on transition plan disclosures for listed companies in the first half of 2024. The FCA is aiming for the transition plan requirements for listed companies to come into force for accounting periods on or after the 1st of January 2025, and the first reporting would begin from 2026. There are a lot of concerns about different jurisdictions having different transition plan requirements, so international alignment is crucial. 
with an eye on the UK adopting the International ISSB Sustainability Disclosure Standards, the TPT framework has been designed to be consistent with the IFRS S2 Climate Related Disclosure Standard. So the TPT framework leverages the ISSB's definition of a climate related transition plan that you saw earlier. It applies the same approach to materiality and embodies the wider set of concepts and definitions that are set out in the ISSB's standards. I'll now pass over to Cynthia to cover some more regulations that are on the horizon. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in the UK, there is a UK sustainability disclosure regulation. This proposes requirements to set out disclosure and labeling applicable to investment managers with the aim of preventing greenwashing. However, you'd find that this re uh, regulatory regime is also relevant for insurers as greenwashing actually affects all PR, uh, FCA regulated entities. And what does greenwashing mean? Greenwashing actually relates to statements made by companies, declarations, looking at actions or communications that do not clearly and fairly reflect the underlying sustainability profile of an entity and also considering the products and the services that are offered. So the FCA is proposing to introduce this greenwashing rule as part of the SDR framework. It requires entities to ensure that the references to sustainability of a product or services are consistent with sustainability profiles of the product and there is clear, fair and not misleading information. What we are expecting is that a policy statement will be issued before end of the year and it will apply on publication date. One particular thing to note about this anti-greenwashing rule is it relates to other existing FCA principles and rules. For example, with principle seven on communication with clients, looking at COBS, where there's the fair, clear, and not misleading rule. One particular note is on consumer duty, where there is a linkage in relation to consumer facing disclosures. We are anticipating that this will be incorporated as well into the FCA ESG source book and links directly with the sustainability disclosures. So as a point of action for companies, they would need to ensure that public disclosures or commitments are substantiated with clear plans and actions. And this links in to say, for example, what has been highlighted by Paul with the transition plans. And then also with communications, there has to be consistent and reliable communication across the board, where when you look at material that are produced for marketing and client communications, and also including websites. If you could move on to the next slide, please. In relation to sustainability reporting standards, in June, July 2023, the ISSB issued the IFRS S1, which relates to sustainability disclosure standard, and IFRS S2, which relates to climate. However, specific to the UK, these standards have been supported by the government, and there is an endorsement roadmap that has been set out which will come under the banner of the UK Sustainability Disclosure Standards. And we are expecting these to be uh, published in July, 2024. Entities that are, are, are already looking at sustainability, say from uh, a, 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 using other frameworks, there is a roadmap that they could consider in terms of meeting these requirements. So for example, where an entity has already adopted the TCFD, there is an opportunity to identify and consider what gaps exist from an IFRS S2 perspective, and also looking at what are the specific sector and industry metrics 
that needs to be taken into account. The reporting using IFRS S2 actually provides additional requirements which enable more granular disclosures, such as looking at the basis of calculation and presentation of climate proposals that companies would have made. If the organization has already adopted, say, for example, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Boards uh, framework, which has now been incorporated into the IFRS framework, there are considerations on the strategic and process-related requirements when looking at governance, strategy, and risk management. This also enables data collection processes for industry-specific metrics. And one thing to note from a UK perspective, it is still voluntary. And as companies are transitioning, they could actually start mapping out what differences exist with existing frameworks and what will be required by the ISSB framework in preparation of their transition phase for the UK specific standards. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So we've got the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures Framework, which is similar in a sense to the TCFD framework as it is actually developed aligning with the TCFD recommendations. And there are three specific nature-related requirements which are centered around stakeholder rights and engagement, looking at priority locations, to accommodate specific consideration arising from regional differences and looking at upstream and downstream value chain risk and impact management. This, uh, this framework at the moment is actually voluntary in the UK, but what we would want to note is that the ABI and also the PRA are looking at nature-related risks as they sort of provide a linkage with what happens with climate. So perhaps companies could start considering what this means for their business. And I now hand over to uh, Paul uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you, Cynthia. Before covering the questions and answers, just wanted to mention that you will be receiving a copy of this presentation and a link to all of the webinar recordings from this week. Any unanswered questions that are put in the Q&A box will be collated and circulated after the week of webinars finishes on Friday. So we just have enough time to cover a couple of questions, Cynthia. So I think if a swift response is possible, that'd be great. One for you, I think here, Cynthia. If the UK endorses ISSB standards as they currently stand, how do they differ to the TCFD rules that we're already applying? Thank you, Paul. So uh, the ISSB standards and the TCFD have already, like specific to climate, there's been a mapping that's been done where you actually find there are additional requirements, say, for example, with governance, the existing bodies that are charged with managing uh, climate risk, would there will be a requirement to have more granular details in terms of the roles and responsibilities that exist, particularly when we look at the board responsibilities. I'll leave it that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And the second question, which I think I'll take is, if the FCA is preparing transition plan rules for listed firms, and the UK government is doing the same for larger companies, won't we end up with misalignment, which is what we don't want? And um, Absolutely. And the UK government in its Green Finance Strategy document in March had already anticipated this and said that they'll be working closely with the FCA to make sure that the requirements for listed companies and the requirements for larger companies are consistent with one another. OK, that's all the time we have for questions today as i said any unanswered questions will be answered in the week of webinars so can i say thank you very much for joining this webinar and can i provide a little bit of advance notice that tomorrow morning's webinar will be on corporate reporting requirements 
what insurers should focus on in 2023 year end accounts. And you'll be able to access the registration link for this from the Mazars webpage that's linking all of the webinars for this week. Thank you again to Cynthia and myself, Paul Hamelainen, and have a good day.